Section 5 of the Arizona Real Estate Contract, Warranties. So a warranty in real estate is a lot like the warranty you get on a purchase of a new car and item where you buy a television, there's a one-year warranty saying it's going to work. Warranties in real estate is either the seller or buying, um, making a statement, guaranteeing that the house is going to be in a certain condition, that things are going to happen with it. And much like the warranty deed we talked about a couple episodes ago, it's going to be that the seller is actually planning on defending that on behalf of the buyer if something comes up. So this section five on this one is one of the s smaller sections. I mean, it, it's less than half a page and, uh, but it does have quite a punch for certain things. So in section five warranty, uh, par paragraph five, a starts with a condition of the premise. All right. And it calls out something in bold contracts yelling at you. Buyer and seller agree the premises are being sold in, it, in its present physical condition as of the date of contract acceptance. Now, this is this whole contract as a whole is considered an as is contract. Um, the seller signing this contract this early on in the process is not um, stating that they will fix any material defects that are discovered in uh, inspections. We used to have that a couple of years ago and it really became a, <clears throat> a hassle because there's a lot of vague language in there. So, um, we, we got in a lot of conversations about what working meant. Uh, case in point, you'd have something like the air conditioner unit. Air conditioner turns on, air that's colder than the room air comes out through it. A seller would consider that working. A buyer would get a um, home inspector to come in there and the home inspector would do a temperature test and realize that the air change coming out was not within regular standards. And next thing we're having a conversation about whether or not that's in working condition or not. Um, you get light switches that were like upside down. So you, you, they're not flipping on and off as normal. You have to turn them in the other direction. You'd get those conversations where it's like, well, we want this rewired and this and that and the other thing. So we got rid of all of that. And now it's just, a, you know, it's considered as is. The um, buyer does get to do their inspection period. They, and we're going to be covering that coming up in the next section, uh, section six under diligence. And then they get to come and ask, um, you know, if there are things that concern them, they get to ask for repairs or how would the seller like to rectify the situation. But these warranties are different. This is um, the seller putting up there in this first section right here, condition of premises, right? It states first that the seller is making no warranty to buyer either express or implied as to the condition, zoning, or fitness of any particular use or purpose of the premise. All right. So if you have, if you are purchasing a single family home and you are making the statement and somehow the seller finds out that the reason why you're purchasing the single family home is because you want to turn it into a group home or something that might not be zoned for that area. All right. Just because the seller is accepting your offer is not saying that they're guaranteeing you're going to be able to do that on that place. So, you know, that we get that out of the way really quick. Hey, Whatever you do with the house is what you do with the house, and we're not guaranteeing, you know, that you're going to be able to do it with that house, all right? They also uh, put in there as to the condition, all right? And so the at this point, the seller is literally not saying whether or not the air conditioning is working. They've already said that. That needs to be back there in the disclosure things. Remember, that's what we uh, work the spuds out. But let's say it's it's the middle of winter, and you haven't run the air conditioning, and the seller does not know that the air conditioner is out and went out, you know, something froze up there, right? You, you can't go back on the seller, you know, in the following June and say, hey, the air conditioner isn't working and you, you know, you said it was working. So that's how that line works in there. Um, the other thing is, and this is the important part, is that the sellers shall maintain and repair the premises. So at the earlier possession or close of escrow, all right, so they are going to maintain and repair the premise, all right? So, you know, if, if something happens to it, they got to take care of it. Maintaining also consider stuff like they can't turn the sprinkler system off and let, let all the, the grass die, all right? Um, you might have places where they'll suddenly just decide to drain the swimming pool, all right? That's not maintaining the present, you know, uh, maintaining the property, all right? So this comes in of close of escrow or close of escrow or possession, whatever happens earlier, because sometimes you can't take pre-possession of the property before closing. All right. And the premises, including all personal property included in the sale, will be substantially the same condition as the date of contract acceptance. And 
All personal property not included in the sale and debris will be removed from the premises. So the seller's making two two statements here. And I've had this come up with houses under contract. A house is under contract. Uh, we're moving right along. They've done the inspection period. And next you know, there's a water leak. All right. The seller right here is stating, I will maintain that, you know, and fix that. So, and, and you do see it every once in a while with sellers just like, they're, they're gone. They don't want to put anything else in it. It's their obligation at this point. And the other one is pretty important, right? Uh, any personal property, not including the sale and debris, will be removed from the premise, right? You see a lot of sellers, they move out and they just like, oh, well, we don't have room for the couch. Just leave it. Right? They're not supposed to do that. And technically, with this contract, the buyer could hire somebody to remove and dispose of the couch take the seller to small claims court, show them the bill of the couch they had to get removed and disposed of, and show them this line on the contract and say, Your Honor, they did not uphold the contract. They were supposed to have everything removed. They didn't. Right. That That's how that can happen right there. So, and I, I get that question a lot from buyers. It's like, well, what happens if they leave the place trashed? All right. Then you go, you hire somebody to do all the cleaning and stuff, and then you ask it. No. And we're talking... We're not talking the rugs need to be shampooed. We're not talking that all the paint needs to be touched up. Uh, but a lot of the just the basic common sense stuff, right? Don't leave the couch hanging out there. When I bought my house, I got a smoker. We got lawn tools. We got all sorts of stuff that they just left behind. I mean, we we're happy to get it. It was like free closing gift from the seller on that. But, you know, technically there are people, you know, you, you, we had that option. We could have hired somebody to dispose of it for us. So... Sellers need to remember you have to clean that place out. And that's part of the reason for the walkthrough is to make sure stuff like that is removed. All right. Going on to the next line on here. All right, we're on line 196. Buyer is advised to conduct independent inspections and investigations regarding the premise within the inspection period as specified in Section 6A. We're going to be covering that next week. Buyer and seller acknowledge and understand that they may, but are not obligated to, engage in negotiations for repairs improvements to the premises. Any and all agreed upon repairs and improvements will be addressed pursuant to 6J. So th that all really rolls in, 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 in uh, Section 6 where we're doing the dil diligence. But we're, they're putting it right up there is that we have the option to have a conversation about the, the air conditioner that's not working, that's the home inspector. So we're calling that out early. And mostly just to make sure that people can't say, oh, no, condition of premises, paragraph 5A, you can't, you can't come after us with claims. You know, because I don't know if I've mentioned it before, everything in this contract is written in blood, sweat, tears, and lawsuits. So somebody's, you know, somebody at some time said, oh, no, paragraph 5A, as is. And that supersedes anything that comes in later on in, in section 6. So remember, we are going to have that coming up later on in section 6. All right. And then we're, uh, the seller, going into the next par uh, paragraph, paragraph 5B, uh, warranties that survive closing. Now, a lot of times when a contract is done, all right, when a contract is done, any obligations to the contract are considered, you know, were considered only valid during the time period until the contract was completed. And then the entities of that contract are no longer obligated to do the things they were obligated to do during the contract time. So we have this paragraph in here saying, and there's going to be a couple of things that actually go past closing. All right. And this is warranties that um, survive past closing. All right. For a certain time period. All right. The seller is going to warrant that the seller has disclosed to the buyer and brokers all material latent defects and any information concerning the premise known to the seller, excluding opinions of value, which materially and adversely affect consideration to be paid by buyer. So once again, they're coming straight up. Remember, we had disclosures up here in four. All the things that the people that um, um, sellers have to disclose. We're calling it out again. The seller is coming straight up using the magic word warrant, all right, which has legal weight. All right? Because of that legal weight, that you know, using that legal weight, that means that the seller might be obligated to pay for repairs for things on the buyer side that the seller never disclosed. So it's another one of those little hooks on there. All right? And 
prior to going to line 202, prior to close of escrow, seller warrants that payment in full will have been made for all labor, professional services, materials, machinery, fixtures, or tools furnished within the 150 days immediately preceding close of escrow in connection with the construction, alteration, or repair of any structure or improvement to the premises. What that line in there does is says to the seller anything okay we got the air conditioner fixed all right you asked for it on the benzer we fixed it on the benzer and we're guaranteeing you we're paying the ac company you don't want to get a knock on the door from the ac company 90 days after you've moved into your house because the seller never paid them all right so that's another line calling out or any other incidental stuff uh, uh handyman plumbers all right this is to make sure that the mechanics lien doesn't suddenly come out of nowhere and for you guys who don't know, a mechanics lien is a property, is a lien that you can put on a property. If I am a mechanic, let's say I do roofing, all right, and let's say I put a new roof on your property and you have not paid me yet. After a certain amount of time, I can go down to the courthouse and file what's called a mechanics lien. It acts just like any other lien, like for a mortgage or a tax lien or anything else on the property. And it is there for X until I get paid off. Now, in reality, and I, th I think it's this way here in Arizona too, I've never had to get really get involved with the mechanics lien, is that it needs to be constantly refreshed. So it's almost a paper tiger at that point, because if you're a contractor and you don't get paid on a job, you don't have time to refile the paperwork over and over and over again to keep that lien in place. And especially because that lien may not come due for, or may not actually get addressed till years down the road. But one of the nice things about the mechanics liens is it actually puts a little marker in space and time saying, this is when they were supposed to pay me. And it's been five years and I've been charging them 7% interest a year since then. So um, mechanics liens are really pretty rare, and um, the, but they are out there. And that's what that line's doing right there is it's going to be taking care of any issue with a mechanics lien that might come up. Right? And... The last line on this is seller warrants that the information regarding connection to a sewer system or on-site wastewater treatment facility, conventional septic or alternative, is correct to the best of the seller's knowledge. And you'd be surprised how many people out there did not know that they were on a septic system. You know, especially um, when you downsize in a family, larger families use more uh, septic space. A uh, single guy moves into a house, didn't know it was on septic and lived there for 17 years. Never have a problem. He moves out, family of four moves in, it's backing up two weeks later. All right. So once again, on the buyer side, if this is a concern to you, you hire people to send a camera down your scope, usually during the home inspection uh, period. They will sit there, they'll go through the there and see if there's actually a septic tank on the other side or if it goes right in the sewer. You could also go and search uh, the county records to see if there's still accept, if there's a septic tank permit on the place. However, there's a lot of septic tank permits that are open for places that no longer have septic tanks. So I can't really tell you that that's 100% the best way of doing it. But once again, this is just a seller warranting that out. So in the last paragraph on this one, uh, paragraph 5C, this covers buyer's warranties. Right? This is a buyer stepping up and warranting uh, certain statements they've made. All right? And first line on this, buyer warrants that the buyer has disclosed to seller any information that may materially and adversely affect buyer's ability to close escrow or complete the obligations of this contract. All right? So if there's any reason the buyer is writing an offer and may or may not be able to actually come to closing table and close. Let's say they might have a job offer coming down or they might have job cuts coming down that they are aware of. Um, let's see what else can come out of this. Um, the home buying process has been so stressful. They can't be guaranteed whether or not they're still going to be married to their spouse at the end of the day. Or you have you have a person out there who's legally separated and getting divorced and the divorce is supposed to be done before close of escrow but may be pushed back for whatever reason um that's something that the buyer would need to disclose on this and just coming out of a disclosure uh, class a couple weeks ago one of the things that they covered on this is the buyers who 
want to write five different offers on five different properties. The buyer is obligated in that situation to every time they write more than one offer out there on this thing, on the buyer warranties, they were supposed to be stating, oh, and by the way, I have three different offers out. And you might accept my offer, but I might have already accepted another offer before that. And so I'm just going to cancel on you immediately. Or occasionally you'll get those buyers who, and this was really big back in buyer days, you know, um, back in 2010, 2011, 2012, where buyers wanted to get two or three houses under, uh, under contract and then do the home inspections on all of them and see which one they liked best. They were just trying to have their cake and eat it too. Buyer in every one of those occasions was supposed to write on there, oh, by the way, I'm under contract with uh, three other properties, four other properties, and one of you guys is going to be the winner. Hey, it might be you. Right. That's something the buyer needs to disclose on that. If the seller was to discover that they took their house off the market for X amount of time and then eventually did not sell the house to the buyer because the buyer had this intent to actually go somewhere else in case somebody else's – or short sales. That was huge on short sales. I can't tell you how many people wanted me to write five or six offers on short sales uh, knowing to go with the first bank that actually came up and said, oh, yeah, you can you can do it. And then dump everybody else. And not only is that like a scuzzy thing to do in bad karma, um, the contract here says you, you're you making yourself liable to that. And I'd actually argue the agent themselves are making themselves liable to that. So, all right. So going back to this thing is anything that they're going to, that the buyer has coming up that may materially adversely their effect to close escrow. All right. At the earlier possession of the premises or close of escrow. A buyer warns to seller that the buyer has conducted all desired independent inspections and investigations and accepts the premise. All right. So that's, that's weird. That's a line in there, but it's like at the earlier of possession of the premises or a close of escrow, buyer warns to seller that buyer has conducted all their desired independent inspections and investigations and accepts the premise. We're going to see that in other documents too. It's a reoccurring theme in here. Um, and I'm, once again, blood, sweat, turns, and lawsuits. I'm just, I'm just assuming that somewhere out there, there was some buyer who bought a house, found out something about the house, and turned around there, sued the, the, the seller, said, "You got to give us our money back and take the house back," and because we discovered this actually after we owned the house, and now that we know it, we don't want the house, so take it back. So that's, that's the kind of stuff we see every once in a while. There is no lemon law in real estate. There isn't. There isn't a turner now. I don't know if this is still true, but there used to be a 72 hour turnaround for the loan. So after you got the loan and after you got the keys to your house and you're sitting there all pretty, you could give the money back on the loan and they would, they would take out a little, but you know, that's, that's financially impossible. I mean, if you already had that money to pay back on the loan, why did you borrow the money to buy the house in the first place? So, but that's, you know, that line right there, it, it's a small line, but it's got a rich history. Hey, you've, I, I'm I'm the buyer. I'm saying at a close of escrow, I'm going to do all the inspections I've wanted to do on this thing. All right. So in the last line, here we are in bold again. Line 210. Buyer warrants that buyer is not relying on any verbal representations concerning the premises except as disclosed as follows. So if the buyer is was talking to the neighbor or talking to the listing agent, talk, you know, talking to their agent and the neighbor, even the seller, somebody came up and said, oh, that roof is solid. I watched them put a new roof on it last year. Let's not bother having the home inspector check the roof. All right. So in that particular case, the buyer would be want to write in there said, neighbor told me it's a new roof. That's just calling it out, putting it down on there. We are relying on that information that the neighbor said that there was a new roof as part of her decision why we decided to buy this property and offered that much for that property. Right, does that make sense? Um, verbal representations, um, it really falls down to another line just to see why a line for the sellers and everybody else saying, if the buyer saying is going to say later on in life, oh no, so-and-so told me something. And that affected my decision on whether or not I was going to buy that house. This is where they get to call that out. Because if you do later on, take somebody to court and you're sitting there going, oh, well, the next door neighbor told me this. And that's part of the reason why, but it turned out not to be true. And now I want, you know, don't want the house anymore. This is a line that the other agent, the other uh, lawyer at that time is going to call up. He's going, hey, did you notice 210? And they're going to scroll down. 
Is this your initial on the bottom, you know, bottom of this paper? Is this your signature down over here? And they're going to ask you the question, did you read the whole contract like you're supposed to? And what are you going to say? No, I just randomly initial stuff that people in front of me. I don't read the whole contract. Right. You guys might have remembered uh, when I first started this whole thing, I, I told you it usually takes me two hours to get somebody to go through a contract on this one because we're pretty much, I'm making sure that they, they're reading everything as we go through. They have a copy, I have a copy, they're sitting there looking at things, they're reading it, and I'm telling you what they means. And people hate it, but we only do it once. But I never hear those words, oh, I never read that in the contract because my first words out of my mouth is, you remember the two and a half hours we sat there? So that's that line right there this is this is section five this is warranties it's a uh, very small very powerful a lot of things going on in here so just remember when you start having those things um i'm going to do a home inspection uh, actually we're doing a final walkthrough tonight six o'clock i'm going to be meeting out there we've had a lot of rainstorms going on if we walk into that house and the ceilings collapse in the kitchen Right. Here's a condition of premises staying here that the seller is going to maintain that property, maintain and repair it. Right. So the buyers don't feel like they have to buy a house without a brand new maintained or repaired, uh, you know, kitchen roof. Right. So this is how this thing comes up all the time. Same thing with the warranties that survive closing. After I bought my house, six months later, I got a knock on the door and it was from a contractor who had done work on my property. That in the seller had not paid them right when that knock happens on your door and stuff like that you know paragraph 5b is what protects you from them being able to put a lien on your property one it was past 150 days for one and two just literally sit there and going i'm not the you know i'm not that guy i am the owner you know the seller has warranted all of these uh, all these uh, payments would be paid. You still need to have to go after him. And at that point, if I had the address, I would have happily handed the address off to that contractor and drove him to the place. Maybe even handed him a baseball bat so he can get his money back from that guy. But you know that's how that got. You know I was protected in that because of this uh, phrase in the contract. All right, and the buyer's warranties. You know. The seller needs to make sure that the buyer is not going to have something come up. I mean, when you're looking at a bunch of different offers and they're really close, you know, you that's things that go through sellers' minds. It's like, hey, what about these people? What happens if something happens to them? What about this? All right, so that's what the buyer warranty is. It's coming. If there's anything that might come up, that's where they're supposed to disclose it. All right, so thank you much, and this is the end of Section 5. Next week, we're going to be covering Section 6, which is due diligence, and this is where we go into the inspection period. It's a... Uh, quite long and I will be talking a lot on that one so see you next week